Before we get into this video, I just want to say thank you to all of our members. We recently introduced our join button to the channel and the response was amazing. So thank you, huge thank you to all of our members so far. Um, if you're interested and you find this video helpful, please also consider joining. Um, it does help us a lot. So go ahead, check it out. And yeah, let's get into the video. Welcome to this Handy Houdini Tips video. In this one, we're going over instancing. Now, I've been doing a lot of terrain work recently, and as part of that, there's been a lot of instancing and orientation stuff and scattering, all of that that goes into creating terrains. And all of that's extremely useful. Oftentimes you'll need to scatter a bunch of points, and to those points you'll need to copy shrubs and trees and rocks and have them oriented in different ways and scaled down and have color variation. All of those things are extremely important when creating realistic environments. However, there's more to it than that. You can often use these exact same tips and tricks for generating all sorts of cool procedural systems. So I'm going to be explaining how to use things like orientation attributes, how to get variation in all of your scatters so that you can use those attributes that you generate on your points to get really good instancing. So let's get into it. We're going to go straight into Houdini to start. In Houdini, I'm going to go ahead and drop a geometry node. And the first thing that we're going to be looking at is orientation attributes. So what I'm going to be doing is just pasting this little set of nodes that I have here. This is just so we have a sort of axes representation. This is going to be useful for understanding how our orientation attributes adjust the rotation of our geometry. So we're going to go ahead and drop a sphere over to the side. And with the sphere, I'm just going to add a normal node. Now, normals are the first attribute that we're going to be looking at. The reason normals are so useful for orientation is because of what they are. They are a vector that represents the direction perpendicular to a particular geometry surface. So any geometry, when you have your normals generated on them, so in this case, a sphere, the normal directions will always be perpendicular. And I'm sure you can imagine how that's useful. Say if we wanted to copy a bunch of trees onto the surface of that geometry, we could use the normal direction to align those trees in the correct manner. So that's why it is an orientation attribute. However, it's not the best way to orient. And I'm going to explain a couple of things to you, but let's just test it first. So over here, we can drop a scatter node and let's just scatter a couple of points. We're just going to do 300. Now we're going to want to copy these cubes onto these points, but they're going to be a bit big. So let's also work with a scale attribute. So let's go ahead and drop an attribute wrangle over here. And in this attribute wrangle, we're just going to affect our P scale. So P scale is the uniform scaling attribute. Anytime you're affecting P scale, you're affecting all axes uniformly. So we're just going to say at P scale, and that is a float. We're going to make it equal to 0.1. So everything is being scaled down to 0.1 times its original size. Now we can use a copy two points. Second input will take our points. First input will take this little orientation thing that we have going. Okay, cool. Something to know about normal directions, right? If we take a look at our scatter, we have these normal directions which are facing away from the surface of our geometry. Now, when we copy two points, Houdini automatically aligns the z-axis of our geometry to the normal direction that we're bringing in. So that's how it uses it as an orientation attribute. It'll take the z-axis and align it to the normal direction. And we can actually see this when we copy two points, right? We have all of these blue rectangles pointing away from the surface. That means that it's taking our z-axis, right? And aligning it to the normal direction. Now the normal direction actually works in conjunction with another orientation attribute. The two of them give you a lot more control. So the other attribute that is being used is the up attribute. So we say v at up, and we can make v at up equal to whatever vector we want. So we're just going to set this to the default, which is zero, zero, zero. And this is the same thing as not having an up vector at all. Now the up vector is what the y axis aligns to. So if the normal direction is what the z axis aligns to, then the up vector is what the y axis aligns to. And we can test this. So let's say we want to align our y axis with the x axis, right? If we set the x axis of our v at up attribute to one, you'll notice that all of these green ones, so that's again, your y axis is aligning to x. And change that value over there. Let's align all of our y axis to y. Just like that, they're all pointing up and so on and so forth. So we can again align it to Z as well, just like that. Okay, so we kind of now understand how normals and up work together. There are some issues with this though. One of the major issues is what is known as gimbal lock. Now I'm not going to go into it too much, but the issue is that there's not enough information in the rotation 
to account for certain angles. So what will happen is it'll flick from a certain angle to another angle and it just won't look right, right? There's an issue in that. So we actually need a quaternion. Now, quaternions tend to strike fear into people, but you don't really need to understand how quaternions work. You just need to understand how to work with quaternions. So what that means is that you just need to kind of understand the workflows. Over here, let's turn all of this into a quaternion. Now the quaternion that we're looking for is called orient, at orient. That is the attribute that we're looking for. It is a vector for, and it's the one that Houdini prioritizes. So if your normal direction exists and up exists and orient exists, it'll ignore your normal direction, it'll ignore up, and it'll use your orient attribute. So let's create that orient attribute. But let's actually take the normal direction that we have and the up attribute that we have, turn it into a quaternion and assign it to our orient value, right? So what we're doing is we're converting what we have into an orient attribute. And there's a pretty nice way of doing this. So we'll create a matrix, and that's just a matrix three, and we can call it something like M, and make that equal to a make transform of our normal direction and our up vector. So we'll say V at M and V at up. What that will do is it will create a transform with the normal direction and the up vector. And what we can then do is create a quaternion based on this matrix. So all we have to do now is say P at orient, and P is for a vector four. So you might've seen V at whatever, so V at N, that's for a vector three. P at orient is for a vector four. So we say P at orient equals, and then we just need to say quaternion, and in there we'll just put our matrix M. So that's converting our transform matrix into a quaternion. Now, the interesting thing is that our copy to points is now using that orient attribute. And we can test this by deleting the other attributes. If we just do an attribute delete, we can delete our normal direction and our up vector just over here, up and N. And if we take a look over here, okay, we only have orient and P scale and it still orients perfectly fine, right? So that's just one method of converting your normal directions with a vector up into an orient attribute, right? And this is pretty useful. So keep this in mind, let's make transform with the quaternion conversion of a matrix three. Next, let's look at how we can actually rotate a quaternion because oftentimes you'll want to rotate a quaternion around a particular axis. And so I'm going to show you how to do that now. Firstly, let's create a rotation float, how much we want to rotate by. So we'll just say float rotation, and we'll make that equal to a channel float. I just call it rotation. Okay. So next we're going to create a vector four, which is actually going to hold our rotation information. And then we can use that to affect our actual orient attribute. So we're going to create a vector four, just like that. And we can call this a rotation quaternion, rotation underscore quaternion, and make that equal to quaternion. So we're going to have two parts to this. We're going to have the rotation amount and the axis to rotate around. So the first part is based on our rotation. So we're going to convert this from degrees to radians, and we're going to be taking in our rotation, right? The second thing is the axis to rotate around. So I'm just going to set it to the Y axis for now, zero comma one comma zero. So next we're going to actually rotate our orient attribute by this vector four that we've created. So to do that, we're just going to say P at orient equals Q multiply. So we're multiplying one quaternion by the other. We're going to take our orient attribute as the first argument. And the second argument is just going to be our rotation quaternion, rotation quaternion, just like that. And now we can create our spare parameters. I'm just going to edit it so that it ranges between zero and 360 for degrees. So over here, just to 360, just like that. And now we have a nice little setup where if we go down here, we can actually rotate around a particular axis. So you'll notice that as I'm rotating, it is rotating around the Y axis, right? If you imagine it as like a skewer, everything is rotating around it. So it's like a rotisserie around the Y axis. And we can change which axis that works around. So we can set that to X and again, rotate around the X axis. And again, if we rotate around the Z axis, it should rotate around the one that's pointing away from the surface. And that's exactly what it does, right? So we have really nice rotations going on and we're using quaternions. The cool thing about this is that this is its basic form, but you can add a lot of variation to this and individually rotate each point, right? So you can do randomization based on point numbers and things like that and end up with really nice orientation variation. So that's cool, that's one part. The next thing that we're going to look at is something that actually does a lot of the work for us. So I just want to show you this 
because this is a bunch of useful information to know when actually affecting your quaternions and kind of how they work. But if you want the easy way to do this, you can use a scatter and a line. So the scatter and a line node does a lot of the work for you. If we plug our sphere into the scatter and a line, we'll end up with a couple of points over here. And so we're just going to choose exactly how many points we want. We're going to say a number of points. And again, we can just set this to like 500, so that's okay. If we plug this into our target points over here and copy these to this, what you will notice is that in this case, your y-axis is actually oriented to your normal direction. And I do actually think that this is just something to make it more intuitive because generally you would want the vector that is facing up to be facing away from your surface. So I do think it's just something to make it intuitive and it's a little bit different to the copy to points where it's orienting your z-axis to your normal direction. Just something to keep in mind. So I'm just going to push up the coverage that actually adjusts your p-scale. So as you can see, there's a lot of useful things that come from using the scatter and the line. As you can see, it generates your orient, a normal direction, and a p-scale for you. So already that's incredibly useful. However, what you can do from here is add some randomization. So if you need some randomization, you can do some random rotations. So that's actually affecting the cone angle from the normal direction. So if you have your normal direction, it creates a cone and it varies the direction from there, right? Or you can rotate around the normal, so around the y-axis, as if we were multiplying over here by the y-axis. So in this case, if you do that, you can see it rotates around the y-axis, right? And that's the minimum angle. It just generates a random value between the minimum and maximum. So it's something like that. Now, all of that's incredibly useful, but something that I find particularly useful is actually taking two quaternions, so two orientation attributes, and then blending between them. Because what you can do with that is something like a growth solver, where you have it running along a surface, and as, say, your grass is growing, it's going from straight up to kind of like a turn. And that's a really nice effect to have, especially when you're having an animated growth effect. So to do something like that, you can actually make a copy of this scatter and line node. So if we just copy this over, the only thing that you really need to keep the same between the two of these is the global seed and the total points. Because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be matching the orientations based on the point numbers. So we don't want those to be weird, right? We don't want them changing between these nodes. So on the first one, we're just going to copy that over. So we're going to copy parameter, paste relative references, and do the same for the seed. So if we now have this second scatter in the line, and we use this one for all sorts of randomization, so we can have like some max angle stuff and some cone angle stuff, all of these things, right? So this one has a more varied orient attribute. So we can actually take this now and blend between those two. So if we have an attribute wrangle right over here, we can go into first input and second input. So all we're going to need to do is fetch our orient attribute from the second input, right? So we can make a vector fall called randomization, and we can make this equal to the second input's orient values. So we can just say point from second input. So we say one comma, the name of the attribute that we want, which is orient. And we just need to say which point we're looking for. So we're actually just looking for the currently processed point, right? Remember, this is why we're keeping them matching between the two sides so that we can just use at pt num to get the matching point. Then all we have to do is interpolate between these two. So what you'll do for that is just a p at orient and we'll make it equal to a linear interpolate. Now I'm going to show you the linear interpolate first, but this isn't the best way to do it. I'm going to show you the alternative afterwards. So we have at orient into the first argument and we have randomization into the second argument. And as a third argument, we just need a blend. So we can actually make a channel float for that and we can just call that blend. Just like that, we create our channel float over there. Let's plug this into our copy to points and let's take a look at what that does. If we go ahead and blend, you'll notice that they all kind of move from their rest position into this randomized orientation. But you'll also notice something that's a bit weird. Some of them tend to suddenly flip, right? This doesn't seem like a very smooth interpolation. If you look at this one over here, it's doing some really weird things. And that's simply because of the way that we're interpolating, right? This linear interpolate isn't the best way to go from one quaternion to the other. If we just change this to s lerp, it actually fixes this for us. It takes the most efficient way of interpolation between one orient attribute and the next. So if we take a look at this, it's a much smoother orientation shift. So with that in mind, you can do loads of cool things, right? So 
if we go ahead and just add a point over here, and let's just move this point up. I'm just going to increase our point size so that we can actually see what we're doing here. So we're just going to set the x value to sine of at time multiplied by some big value. And we'll do the same for cosine at time times 10. So we have this point that now just moves in a big circle. We can actually speed this up. We'll do 100. So 100 over there. Okay, so it goes in circles just like that. And we're going to ray that onto the surface of our sphere. We have our sphere. We're going to ray this point onto the surface using minimum distance and other way around over here. So our point now just sticks to that surface and moves around. And now we can give it an attribute and we'll transfer the attribute over and use it to control all of our orientation and scale and all of those things, right? So over here, what we can do is just add an attribute to it and we can just call this something like at intensity and make that equal to one. And then we can use an attribute transfer to transfer that over. So we'll use an attribute transfer. So we'll transfer it onto the incoming geometry over there and transfer our intensity over. We're going to have to make some changes. So one of the things that we'll do is just set our intensity attribute to zero on the incoming geometry to equal zero. And now that we're transferring it over, we'll just transfer intensity. We'll decrease the radius. So we'll put that to zero and just a blend width. So if you want to visualize that, you can check your node information, click on intensity. As you can see, there is an area like that that just moves around. And we'll just set our real time toggle. As you can see, we just have that value that moves around. Okay, so that's pretty cool because now we can use that to drive certain things. So let's actually use that instead of our blend value. So instead of our blend, let's use at intensity, at intensity. And now in this copy to points, what you'll notice, and let's just switch off that visualizer, is that as that goes around, it changes those orientations. We're adjusting the orientation from the rest position to the adjusted orientation just using this, right? So this is like something that you can do to actually generate really interesting instancing. And again, you can add a bunch of stuff to this. You can affect your p-scale. You can say add p-scale equals fit zero one. So in here, we can take our intensity, add intensity and fit it between a new range. So we can say that the smallest that it can go is 0 0.001 and the largest that it can go is 0 0.1, just like that. And now you have something like this. And so as you can see, when you do things like this, you can end up with some really good instancing, right? You can actually adjust a lot of the information that's going into this and end up with some nice effects. So, so this is super basic, but if you do things like color and all sorts of variation, you end up with some really nice effects. And this is just to give you a feel for how to work with orientations, because that is the most important thing. If these were trees or rocks or whatever it is, you're getting really good variation in this case. If you had something where you want grass to grow over time, you can have all sorts of twisting and things going on. All of that is really cool. In a future video, I will be showing you how to do this in Karma and actually use variants and have like animated instances. And then it gets really cool because then you can have things like flowers blooming and twisting and all sorts of awesome things. So I'll be showing you that soon. In the next part though, we're going to be going over creating surface scatters. So things like moss and snow and all of that. And then you combine your knowledge with this and all of a sudden you have really cool systems being generated where you have interesting sort of mass generation. And yeah, so all of that is coming up, but I hope that this was helpful for you. I hope that this helps you understand orientation and the kind of attributes that go into instancing. So thanks for watching and I will be seeing you next time. Bye.